What's Lean Six Sigma and how does it fit in the St. Lucie County Strategic Plan? Find out next on Inside St. Lucie. Hello and welcome to this edition of Inside St. Lucie, SLC TV's monthly government affairs show. I'm your host, Eric Gill, Communications Director for St. Lucie County. And on today's program, we're going to talk about the strategic plan, the upcoming budget session with St. Lucie County Administrator Howard Tipton and County Commissioner Franny Hutchinson. But before we meet our guests, there's some upcoming events and announcements from the Board of County Commissioners. St. Lucie County offices and attractions will be closed on Monday, February 15th in observance of President's Day. A reminder that all St. Lucie County attractions, including the Oxbow Eco Center, St. Lucie County Regional History Center, St. Lucie County Aquarium, and libraries are back and open to the public with limited capacity. St. Lucie County libraries continue to offer curbside pickup but are open for walk-in visitors, and many programs have been restored or are either being offered virtually or at outdoor meeting spaces. Guided hikes offered by the Environmental Resources Department have returned with extra steps taken to follow CDC guidelines regarding COVID-19. For dates and topics, visit slchikes.org. Now for the latest updates about all St. Lucie County Commission meetings, workshops, and events, be sure to visit our website at stlucieco.gov and click on our comprehensive calendar. And if you'd like to be added to our press release distribution list, send us an email at pio at stlucieco.org. We also hope you'll follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We're going to take a quick break. Before we do, we're going to check in with the latest economic development stats with another St. Lucie Works. COVID still continues to impact St. Lucie County's bed tax revenue, with November's numbers decreasing by nearly 25% compared to the same time frame in 2019. Overall building activity remained steady in November with 1,034 permits submitted compared to October's 1,045 permits. Revenue for that same time frame, however, dropped by 234%, generating more than $176,000. The housing market continues to weather the COVID storm. According to the Florida Realtors Association, the median home sale price in St. Lucie County for November was $259,575,000 up 7.5% from last year, while condo values rose by 45% with the median price at $235,000. St. Lucie County's unemployment rose slightly in November to 6.4% compared to October. Statewide, the unemployment rate was 6.3%. The largest increases in the labor force in the Treasure Coast were in construction with 1,000 new jobs and manufacturing with 600. The largest decreases were in government, education and health services, and leisure and hospitality. If you work for local businesses looking for skilled or trained labor, be sure to contact the staff at Career Source as they can assist your company with its recruitment and training needs. And if you are an individual looking for a job, they can help you as well. Visit the Career Source online at careersourcerc.com or call 1 866 4 u 2 hire. Welcome back to Inside St. Lucie. I'm your host, Eric Gill, and I'm joined by St. Lucie County Administrator Howard Tipton. Howard, thank you for joining us yeah, Good today. to see you, as always. Yes. Well, you and I see each other a lot. That's but true. <laughs> not in this setting. It's been a while since you've been on the show. It has been. Yeah. Thanks for coming back on. And uh, we're later on, we're going to talk with County Commissioner Franny Hutchison, and she had just we talk about the strategic plan planning process that okay. we, we've moved into. But one of the things that led to that or came before that is uh, the Lean Six Sigma Sure. and the uh, Florida Benchmark Consortium process. And right. folks not in government may not have heard of Lean Six Sigma. I mean, I've been here 18 years and it's still a fairly new concept for us. So. Yeah, so what it is, is in simple terms, it's just a commitment to performance excellence. And that's what we're trying to do. We know that every day we have to do things differently or at least faster, better, cheaper in order to kind of keep up. And so what Lean Six Sigma's focus on is kind of a process to help us evaluate how we're doing in whatever area we choose to study. And so um, it's a, it's a five-step process, the Six Sigma process. We call it the DMAIC process. So it's define, measure, analyze, Im Im improve, and then control. And all that means is you, you kind of focus on the things that are going to move the line graph, kind of improve performance the most. You focus on those. You get that definition and then you implement it, but you have to circle back and then see how, how did we do? 
Did it have the intended results or are there other things that we should be looking at? And so it's just a constant, constant continuous improvement process. And we've got some pretty good projects that, that we've looked at. Um, we've looked at inmate medical where we spend a, a considerable amount of money. And so the, the process there, we, we implemented a, a, a task force in September and uh, looking at ways that we can continue to improve the process. The good news is we're down 22% in expenditures from last year. So we're seeing some improvement, but there's, uh, you know, at least it seems like there's an opportunity to do more. We uh, took a look at uh, accidents, uh, employees uh, driving vehicles and accidents, and in over a two-year period have been able to reduce that by 30% uh, by focusing in on some of those key training aspects in, in that case. But we've looked at our heavy fleet, uh, making sure that we understand that, you know, we, we have a real desire here to hold on to vehicles just as long as we possibly can. And the problem is when you do that, they're down a lot. So they're out of commission, which means that we're not getting the work done that we need to do. And so what we realize is, is if we turn these vehicles over regularly, we have a much higher degree of activity uh, in, in terms of getting the work done and our maintenance costs go down as well. And so we actually save money and we're more productive. Yeah. And so just taking a look at all the different aspects that we do, we, we took a look at building permits and how, how can we turn those around quicker. And we found that in that study, uh, we didn't have sufficient plans examiners and the plans examiners we had didn't have enough of the different certifications because it's hard to find one person who can do it all. Sure. And so we created incentives uh, for the plans examiners to, to get those additional certifications and now our turnaround time is much better. Yeah. So just, just ways to continuing to improve. Yeah, and I've had the pleasure of doing the Yellow Belt and Green Belt training, which you know, I was hoping we were break woods and I'm watching a lot That's of right. Cobra Cry stuff. But uh, <laughs> in all seriousness, it, it is a unique process because in, in the, the gentleman who taught it, Bruce, I can't remember his last name now, but he had spent years with fp and yeah. So private companies, this isn't unique to just government, private companies can use this too. And he talked about how they were looking at, I think it was injuries on the job and everybody kind of, your first, oh, it's because of dog bites. But when they dug into it, it, you know, it was other issues and it's really pouring at into the data and finding out what the root cause of the problems are. Yeah, you're exactly right. In fact, the first time I ever heard the, the term uh, Six Sigma and they talked about those yellow belts and, and green belts, and I'm a black belt in Taekwondo. I thought this is great, <laughs> <laughs> but it's completely different. Yeah. Um, and I'm also a, a yellow and green belt, just like you. Yeah. And, uh, and so it is, it's making sure that you define the problem because what, whatever we study is what we're gonna work to improve. So if we don't define the issue clearly, we could be studying the wrong thing. Sure. And that happens all the time. Yeah, and that's one of the things too, it's the same thing, a lot of communications efforts, you know, we try to look at metrics, you know, did this Facebook post reach the audience we needed to, but it's, you've yeah. gotta have that data, you know, and it's getting easier in this day and age because of digital tools. And, and one of those things that we've implemented about a year ago is a clear point strategies mm -hmm. that help departments track and define their measurable goals. So, so exactly right. So once a quarter we get together with all of the department directors and we go over the scorecards that each of their areas have. And we wanna make sure that we are progressing on the targets that we set at the beginning of the fiscal year. And so it's just real simple, right? Red, we're not meeting it. Yellow is we're okay, but could be better. And green is we're on target. Yeah. And we have conversations that are focused on those things that we think will drive our performance. We don't spend a lot of time on anything else because everything else may not get us the, the, the real value that, we, that we've already previously defined. So we focus really and spend our time on those things that are gonna drive performance. Absolutely, and, and, and that also leads into the next segment when we talk about the um, strategic plan. Sure. Because you know the board, and it, it's a document, a, kind of a roadmap for the board of county commissioners and, and the departments they oversee to help them define what services we provide to the, to the community. Absolutely. So the strategic plan lays out the, the vision, the mission, the values, and then the goals, really. And that's, those broad objectives are what then the organization sets about through our budget process and everything else we do to achieve that overarching mission statement and, and, and vision statement. And uh, it's, I think, the first very uh, comprehensive strategic plan that we've had. Uh, we used uh, a, a national uh, community survey um, model, uh, which a number of cities do, including Port St. Lucie, uh, to give us that citizen feedback. You know, how do you feel about the quality of life? How do you feel in terms of safety in your community? 
uh, with all of that information, we're able then to, to take that back and then with the board's perspective, create those uh, five, in our case, goals uh, that are, are the focus of what we do. Um, but I really appreciate it in this process that we were able to do uh, the, the vision statement, which is endless opportunity by design. You don't get the future that you hope for. You get the future that you plan for, that you work towards. And, and having something very specific in terms of that uh, plan for our future is it's it's exciting and yeah. and it's a and it's for St. Lucie County this is going to be a great place because of the plan that's in place. And I got to serve on that initial strategic team. I remember us yeah. you know we th we're throwing out phases for the board to consider. I remember I like that too. You know, endless opportunity by design. You know, it's not by accident. It's yeah. you know on purpose. The stuff you get by accident usually you don't want. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sometimes you get happy accidents. That's right. Yeah, Bob Ross right. always taught me that, right? That's happy right. accidents. That's right. Hey, we can work with that. <laughs> but uh, and speaking of things that we uh, you, accidents that we don't have control over, going into the budget session, you know, we got legislative session coming up. Yes. <laughs> um, sometimes those aren't unhappy accidents they throw down to us at the state level. But. Yeah. So one of the concerns that we have this year is that um, with the economy and as a result of the pandemic at the state level, they're looking at a multi-billion dollar shortfall in terms of revenues. And so we typically are in a defensive posture anyway. Um, but I think this year it's going to be difficult for anybody to to uh, receive anything additional. And I think what we're trying to do is just hold on to what, what we, we have. have and try to ride this thing sure. out. Uh, our community is doing better than many around the state and we're fortunate. Again, I think that's by design. I think we have a much more diversified base and uh, we're able to uh, suffer or, or overcome setbacks in certain areas and have other segments actually do very well. And we're seeing that today. Um, but at a statewide level, because Florida is so tourism based, uh, they are definitely seeing the shortfall. Sure. And, I, you know, we could talk about the, uh, probably a whole nother show, but uh, at least how the pandemic has impacted us. But like you said, I think building permits continue to, continue to increase. Housing yeah. values continue to be sta stable. Yeah. You know, tourism took a dip, but, you know, last year was also a record year right. in tourism. And I think they were... Um, you know, recognizing that when they did the budget, they didn't Absol plan to yeah. match next year's budget. Absolutely. Year. So we, we budgeted for about 80% of what the projected revenue was supposed to be. And we ended up coming right in at budget. And yeah. so uh, many places uh, like in Orange County and Orlando saw tremendous shortfalls in their uh, in their tourist tax. And also their sales tax was hit a lot harder. Yeah. Uh, and so we're just fortunate. We're in a good place. And I think, again, it's by design. Uh, but we're, uh, compared to other places, certainly in the state and around the country, I think St. Lucie County has a lot to be hopeful for as we work our way through this pandemic, but then really optimistic about the future going ahead. Yeah. Anything else you want to mention about the strategic plan? I know it was a little different this year, too, because we started uh, that process right about the time the pandemic hit. So a lot of public workshops were virtual and our facilitators was virtual and you know it, it wasn't uh, we, one of the things that we've learned to be is adaptable and flexible yeah. right and uh, we actually had um, a pretty good level of participation even though uh, we, we found uh, the virtual as, as kind of the way to go and I think about the port master plan process which is a different plan but sure. you know completely virtual in that regard and actually we had better participation than we do in the when we had it in person several years back sure and so it's uh, it's just the way of the future we, we had board meetings this year where we were virtual and, and doing different things and so um, I, I think it, it, one of the, one of the very few and there aren't many upsides to the pandemic is that we've found that there are uh, certainly with technology, different ways to reach our citizens and for citizens to reach us. Absolutely. And, and that's a positive. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Howard, I appreciate you sharing the time with us today. And yeah. We'll save some time for Commissioner Hutchinson. Well, happy to be here. Right. Happy New Year, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back to talk more about the strategic plan with County Commissioner Randy Hutchinson. Welcome back to Inside St. Lucie. I'm your host, Eric Gill, and this time I'm joined by County Commissioner Franny Hutchinson. Good Commissioner, morning. thanks so much for joining me again. Thank you for I'd shake hands, me. but we'll keep the social I distance know. going. It's hard to do that. <laughs> it is. Um, earlier in the show, we had uh, Howard Tipton on, County Administrator, and we're yes. talking about the uh, strategic planning process that the board went through kind of last year. Last I think year it's about all this time we were starting it. Exactly. It's all kind of blended together but, uh, <laughs> the past few years. Um, 
But you've been on the board now four terms, and that was probably one of the. I mean, in recent, it's been a while. It's been a yes, while. It's, it's in my time because I've been here yeah. about that long too, and it's been a while since we had. No, a we used plan. to have them years and years ago, and they were helpful then. And then with everything, you know, you get change in staff and change in administration and so forth, and they kind of went off. You know, and they weren't near as focused as what this one was, which really surprised me. So when we first were told we were going to be looking into doing it, I was genuinely surprised how well yeah. it went. Yeah. And so. like Howard said, we, we we surveyed residents to get their feedback, which probably helped you all out when you're setting these objectives to say. I don't think I saw any surprises on there, but it was basically kind of a reinforcement to has the board to this time frame that those surveys were taken had they been addressing the issues that were important to the citizens. Yeah. And also, where were we? You know, showed us where we might be lacking and could do a lot better, which you always look for that. Sure. And then you personally, what are some of the components of the plan that you like? I'll tell you, the thing I really enjoyed the most about it was, you know, when you first get told, because they do, they came in and interviewed each of the commissioners individually um, before as they were taking in their notes. And one of the things that really highlighted it to me was a we were going to be changing our vision i was on the board at the time we did the old vision mm -hmm. and it needed to be updated it, it was a good one at the time yeah. right but we've moved into new like you mentioned earlier the new technology a new way of doing things sure. and so it was important that that was going to get changed but the biggest part of it was the check and balances that came into play with this strategic plan um, i think howard mentioned about benchmarks where those benchmarks are truly important because if you go into a strategic plan for five years out, which is what we're kind of basing it on, how do you measure? Are you getting there where you can change course if you need to, if you're veering off sure. and are not accomplishing what yeah. you would set out to be instead of waiting the four or five years? So that part I'm most excited about with it. Yeah, and that was one thing I didn't get to talk to Howard about. We mentioned the Florida Benchmark Consortium, which is a mm -hmm. group of a lot of different government agencies. And it's a great resource for counties that are part of that. So if you want to look at the onboarding time it takes to hire a new employee, you can compare yourself against other communities and, and other government agencies. And you know sometimes those comparisons are easy apples and apples. And sometimes it's a little harder. You know sometimes I, I take offense. Like, Eric, look at what Orange County's doing. Look at these bigger counties that have a lot more resources and staff manpower to do all these right. programs that we may not have. But at the same time, you can look and then see, okay, well, some things are consistent. If we know we're going to hire somebody, you know, it right. should, well, should there's it take that two and, months or And it's hard months. when you start comparing to counties that aren't like. And the True. thing that I've always liked is each county in the state is very uniquely their own. So you get to keep that in mind with it. So you can take what works for other counties if it's something we can put here in place and then kind of improve it on your own. Yeah. Within well, the, well, like coastal engineers. Not every yeah. county in Florida needs no, coastal don't. engineers, no. but we obviously need one with 21 miles of beaches. So <laughs> you can't. And we have know, a great one, by the way. We do. We do. So, We've always had it here. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. <laughs> but um, I just said that because I know you're the erosion chair and <laughs> you're intimately uh, involved in that process. But it does give us at least a benchmark, you know, which, right. like you said, and then you can see if you're hitting those goals. And and eventually, mm -hmm. I think the plan is to, to make that dashboard available to the public so they can, you know. Right. I think that was part of the discussions when we were meeting early on. I think we had two face to face meetings and one of them was actually half virtual yeah. type of thing. Um so and it and it puts it by putting it out to the public, they too are able to see are we doing it, and then can give feedback as we go through. Um, you know, as it goes into the budgeting session, this is our first budget this year that we'll be implementing the the plan, mm -hmm. and not to say anything bad about the plans prior. Sure. Um, the last one we just came off of our fifth year, and it was the driving force with the board you know, and making sure things got accomplished and that they were done and completed, basically to get us out of the deficit at that sure. time. And we were successful with that. So with this one, I hold a much more higher level personally that the success bar is going to be much higher. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and like you said, the, the idea of this and the, the goals and objectives yeah. is so when departments come and say, I, I need $250,000 yeah. for X, it's got to fit in one of the goals and objectives in the strategic plan. Well, it's that and, you know, the flexibility in the plan is also something, you know, like we're going through the pandemic right now and the cost of that and how it affects our budget. 
not just this year, upcoming year, but also in the future. Sure. Um, we've been fortunate enough that we've been able to get funding from both the federal and the state level to help offset some of our costs. So as I think Howard mentioned it earlier, you know, we're sitting better this year than we were last year going into the pandemic. Um, but also because of, I think the board needs to take a little bit of credit along with the citizens, we've kind of diversified where our economic stability comes into sure. play. So I think that's played into it. But in the future rolling out, those funds aren't always gonna be available. So how does it fit in and we don't get, oh, we're doing good this year and let's start spending money. But going back to that 250,000 or whatever the number sure. may be request, it's does it fit in the long-term plan? And yeah. this kind of helps us, you know, this year, as many people aren't aware, <laughs> we have to have the money in the bank before we can spend yes. it. And it's not like the federal or the state. We sure. That money has to be in there. So we're always looking for the partnerships and so forth to get it done faster. But the county has a tendency to always put money to the side every year on big capital projects. And for big plans we have coming down the road. So that can't usually be done on a one-time budget year. So it's kind of spaced out. So that's kind of, be, kind of be a driving force, I think, this year because many of us are very aware that going through this is a first time for everybody a pandemic and what the effects are, not knowing the long term, not having data to fall back on, that this is going to be a trial and error. So I think you're going to see a continued, very conservative look at the budget this year, that we don't get happy, if sure. you will, with it sure. and, and decide to start spending it because we don't know what the effect is going to be long term. Yeah, and that's a good point. It's hard to project. You know, there was a, a moratorium yeah. on evictions and, and mortgages yes, and all that. So as long as that continues to be in place, you know, property values, it always takes like two years for the yeah. values to catch up to the real time. Right, because they're down about a year after the fact. Exactly, so, you know, values have kept going up, but this pandemic, we could see, but it like dips. you said, it won't be an immediate impact, it'll probably yeah. be two years down the road if it, right. you know. And that's one thing, and, and then you brought up about, you know, the eviction process and so forth and everything, and I think the federal government's contemplating at this time from what we're hearing, sure. you know, of sending more, um, resources down to the cities and states mm -hmm. with that and we've got a great team that the county has put together and we make sure because when you're sitting on this side of the dais it's one of those having lived through it we're always keenly aware of the ability for the federal and state to do what i call the clawback yep. years after the fact and we've faced that in the past and it's affected our budgets sure. where i think that year we actually had considered doing a millage drop and at the last, it was like right before the second yeah. hearing, yeah. we got word that it was a confirm they were doing this Take million, it I think it was over $10 million. Money they dollars. Given yes, us, yep. and it was from 10 years prior. Yep. So there's always that, at least in the back of my mind. It is know, in don't. staffs too. We're documenting and yes. documenting. Oh, and I know. Documenting. We've got a great team. That's what I said. We've got yeah. a great team that's working on that. But that's also part of why we have the reserves and we don't want to reach out too far and and as hard as it is, you know, there's a lot of things we want to get done and implement. And I know Howard had talked with you earlier in regards to, you know, the efforts and so forth of what the, how they get together, all the department heads and go over, are we meeting those benchmarks? And we actually have been, and it's going to be surprising. I actually hope we put in a new benchmark on basically affecting emergency turnarounds like we're doing, sure. you know, with a pandemic on where were we able to change and should, is that now going to be a cheaper way of doing business? You know, we've learned with the virtual, doing a lot of our meetings virtual, there was a time that, you know, and there might still be a little bit of our staff that has to work at home, mm -hmm. but how do they check in? How do they get everything is tracked that the work's done? Sure. And I think this is the big new wave that we're going to see in through unemployment. Yeah, yeah. Now, and you mentioned the CARES Act funds. I, yeah. Were you happy with the board's response and, and, and how quickly we got that? Or not boards, but I, staffs. I mean, you got to set the plan I, up. We got the right. 50 or 45 million. Something like yeah. that. It's, they keep, they keep it pushing through. And, you yeah. know, and we were very fortunate. Many counties didn't spend the money right away. They didn't have plans in place uh, early some enough. Some even or said we as, don't need it. And right. Thought. And <laughs> I, lucky for them, I yeah. guess. But... Yeah. Um, I think the way we've handled it, it may not have been the best in the world, but again, if you don't have anything to Remember. look back at and say, how did they do this? This was everyone was learning by the seat of their pants. So my kudos to the staff and all the teams that were brought in 
which were numerous across the county with the cities and the health department and so forth, that we all really focused on what was best and what we could get done and how soon can we get it out on the street where it was needed. Yeah. You know, whether it was from the testing to the vaccines to um, eviction notice issues or helping businesses out that were having to lay off and close their doors during the shutdown. Yeah. And speaking of the pandemic, and it's, I don't want to give too much information because yeah. by the time we get done taping, it's going to change <laughs> after we walk out this every door. Day. But, yeah. you know, so far we're, you know, the end of January here through about three weeks into the pandemic. And as of today's numbers taping this, we've issued over 18,000 vaccines in this county. And, you know, which is about 5,000 more than our neighboring counties. And I know we've got a greater population overall, but you know, we're doing the best we can with the resources we get. Well, and and it's really the health departments taking the lead. It is. And I think a lot of people don't realize this. The county is working in partnership and collaboration with the health department. They are kind of like the one that's taking the lead because they're basically a statue, uh, an arm of the state. state. And they have to take their direction from the state, i.e. the federal and on mm-hmm. up the chain. But we're there to assist in every way we can, you know, whether it's finding locations, that can accommodate giving the vaccines out. Um, the logistics to that, we've got, I think, one going on on the Fin Center this morning. So the traffic had to be dealt with, sure. on, so nobody was in, uh, hurt by that. And then again, on we're at the mercy of when the vaccines come into the county themselves. Yeah. So from a county perspective, we've offered um, storage areas. You know, we were yeah. one of the very few counties that bought the freezers yeah. that could hold the, the vaccine. Pfizer, yeah. Pfizer the, the right. deep sub-zero yes, freezers. That was very, yeah. And those were very specialized yeah. ones on it. Um, not all the counties took advantage of that. And that was some of the CARES Act monies that mm-hmm. were used. Uh, the other part of that is we've helped to put employees over to help run the vaccines yeah. as they're going through at the fairgrounds. Not doing there. the shots. No, not the shots <laughs> yeah. themselves. But, but just the coordination. The coordination like of it and having the somebody there. Yeah. There was the paperwork yeah. to fill out. There was a sterilization yep. as people were going through and leaving and so sure. forth. That stuff still needed to do. And the health department, of course, doesn't have that many employees. You know, their focus should have been, as it is, is on giving the vaccine yeah. out. So, I mean, we've worked with them hand in hand the best we can on trying to get implement getting the word out, yeah. you know, how to sign up, where best to sign up, yeah. and fielding some of the questions that they're getting so they can do the job that they do best, is, yeah. and that's getting people inoculated. And it's one of the challenges is you know, helping, you know, Clint right. and I have a long, we've yeah. known each other a long time, and they don't have a PIO right now, so I'm kind of filling in and helping out for, with public information, and it's just explaining to residents, you know, we have 80,000 residents over the age of 65. Right. But our initial shots were, you know, we get a thousand or three thousand. You know, we just don't, we aren't getting the vaccines in the in the mass amounts that we need to get to in the shots of there. But it isn't just us. It's no, it's not. It's across the nation, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And it's also, it's not a reflection on whether it's the federal, the state. You know, who knew? Yeah. You know how many were going to be known? The, the issue of just months ago, which is. Again, you know, use the warp speed theory sure. if you want. You know, there wasn't a vaccine. Yeah. So not only were we looking at putting, there was an emphasis countrywide on producing a vaccine, but then the next step was implementing it, in which we did. Yeah. In fact, I think all the counties were required by the state of Florida to turn in Plan. implementation mm-hmm. plans, which we did well in advance of the release sure. of the vaccine. And unfortunately, the state changed the rules. <laughs> yes, and that happens. Yeah. And that happens quite a bit. And it, with no knowledge, prior knowledge, we heard it on the news just like everybody else. Yeah. So well, even that's a great speed. example of, yeah. you know, anybody so, could come get a vaccine. And right. now all of a sudden you have to have a Florida ID, driver's license right. or two phone, you know, which. And what are the forms of ID that are acceptable? You yep. know, that's all comes from the direction of the state. That's not something that the county that makes you, up. Yeah, and I'm sure you guys have gotten some calls yes. on that. Oh, we've <laughs> gotten plenty of calls yes. on it. And, and trust me, we would like to have as many people that want the vaccine to have it available for them. Yeah. But we're kind of at the mercy and working as fast as we can, as best way we can, with some type of organization yeah. to, to it. Because you can imagine that when you said 65 how many people are 80,000 80, yeah. over the age of 65? You can imagine if all 80 wanted that vaccine yeah. 
all at the same time, what kind of chaos that and then, would be. Yeah, and I get it because I've had people, well, there should be a priority list of those right. that are older with health conditions. And I'm not disagreeing with you, but who's going to manage that and list I've of gone HIPAA after violations? Clint. Yep. And, yeah. I've gone after Clint on that one, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> on yeah. some of the things. But um, but that's not our place to place it. Exactly. Put those rules on, yeah. and nor are we allowed to. Sure. And we can't circumvent from the ones that are put on by the state. Yeah. So we have to follow that lead. So. But, you know, we're, we're, like you said, we're doing the best we can, and hopefully yeah. the, you know, the pipeline of supply continues to increase. Well, I know, in, in not coming off the subject, because it's a very important yeah. one, but even going tying it back into our strategic yeah. planning and so forth and budgeting, those are the types of things that will be taken into consideration, because we're now drawing off, even though it's three weeks, yeah. we've been able to draw off a little bit of what that data is showing us, which is what's going to drive going through the budgets. You know what happens if you know how sure. better can we do and i'm sure the different teams within the county will be drilling into and looking at that as we move forward in the strategic plan not just for the sure. pandemic today but for any other occasion that sure. comes out yeah you know it, we survived speak, hurricanes <laughs> yeah i know and speaking of the budget process you know over the years it's gotten to be more of a year-round discussion don't you think then it's yes. just uh, all of a sudden it's march departments turn in their budget you guys have a meeting in june july Adopt the resolution in September. No, it is it is a year round, almost a monthly basis. I think we're given usually a monthly update. Some the of them yeah. have actually been shown on the TV and so forth at the informals. And then there's always the conversations between the board and on individual basis with administration. Yeah. You know, if there's questions or if there's things coming up or well, I'm thinking about this, you know, kind of thing. Where are we with it? What can we do? Sure. So all of that, and then again, like you said, in January, the administration's already looking to start the new budget. So are the departments, yep. and then they turn them into March. So it's a steady process that goes through, and it's totally, totally vetted. Yeah. You have the Citizens Budget Committee that comes into play. Sure. Where they're once a month, and they're meeting and going over and it. And they're right, making recommendations yes. on, you know, reserves and things like that. Right. Yeah, and it was interesting because that became a political issue. I don't want to get too much into yeah. polit politics, but Please during don't. the election year, okay. <laughs> but during the election year, it was, well, the Citizens Budget Committee recommended a 1% cut, and yeah. the board didn't do it. But again, that's an advisory board. It's an advisory board and its recommendations that come into play. And I think the year that that was actually done was the year that we'd gotten told about the clawback yeah. within like days, literally, yeah. before that final budget. And that was part of the decision making. Sure. You know, which the citizens' budget had not been given that information when they made their recommendation. recommendation. Sure, sure. On it. The timing so, and communications right. isn't, yeah. So again, it goes back to the flexibility. And I think that's what the plan, you know, having a strategic plan shows you. You don't lose sight of the goal. You just may have to weave a little bit instead of a straight line. And that's because <laughs> even I was worried about that too, as somebody has to put together yeah. a budget. Like, how do I make everything fit? And, but like you said, the categories are brought up health and public safety, you know right. what I mean? Or things yeah. of that nature. So you, it's easy to place your, not easy, but you know, it, it, you it's, a exactly. it's a guideline. It's a guideline. It fits in. Does that it bucket. fit in? Yeah. Right. So. so. And, it, and it'll make it easier during the budget process also. For you guys to say. How, right, because we'll sit there and actually ask each other, how, where does that fit? You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll be prepared. So, I'll, there you I'll go. I'll take notes. <laughs> well, Chris, is there anything else we didn't get to discuss? I mean, no, you, I certainly appreciate this very timely the conversation, and I appreciate you giving it to me. I know. Well, like you said, it's unfortunately these air all months. So the, yeah. the way information's changing lately, it's it's minute by minute. Well, so. I think, like I said, that's the beauty, We do the keep the website too. updated. So. But that's, it, that is the beauty, though, too, also, too, what's going on and having that ability to be flexible yeah. and make things change. That is... Uh, one key thing we've learned over the last 12 months. You almost have to be. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Commissioner, thank for taking you. the time. Thank you for having me. Don't go anywhere. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and wrap up the show. We hope you've enjoyed this edition of Inside St. Lucie. We hope you'll tune in again next month. If you have topics or subjects you'd like to see covered here on the program related to St. Lucie County Government, give us a call at 462-1791 or send us an email at pio at stlucieco.org. And if you'd like to see previous aired episodes of this or other SLC TV programs, visit our YouTube channel at YouTube slash St. Lucie Gov. And don't forget, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at St. Lucie Gov. I'm your host, Eric Gill. For myself and the staff, thanks for watching.